cool. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're glad you could join us today. Uh, we took a couple of minutes to set up. We're also streaming live on Facebook. Uh, that's why it took us a few minutes. Um, on behalf of Women at Braintree and everyone from the PayPal family, um, thank you for uh, everyone who came out. Uh, I know a lot of you came from uh, South Bay, which feels like a different state, depending on <laughs> how long it took you uh, to come here. And I know some of you came from different cities. I know we have people from Chicago here. Um, so thank you for being here. And thank you for our wonderful panelists, uh, not only for taking time being here, but also agreeing to share your uh, expertise and your perspective on payment. Um, so I wanted to begin with kind of sharing, like, what's the goal of like having everyone here? Um, so when we put this together, for us, the goal of uh, today's event was twofold. Uh, it's about how can we have an engaging conversation on payments and e-commerce, um, and also talk to people from different industries, get different perspectives, uh, uh, different uh, uh, companies as well. Um, and that was an easy goal to me. Um, we at Braintree and PayPal are payment geeks. Um, so it was not very difficult. It was super easy to find uh, strong leaders in the space to be our panel. Um, secondly, uh, if you haven't already noticed, we have an all-women panel. Uh, and that was a very conscious choice for us. Uh, typically, many women panel address you know, um, issues that women face as we are advancing in our careers. Um, things like, you know, how do you address imposter syndrome? Um, you know, there's the motherhood penalty. How do you address that? Or even like, oh, how do we find women who are role models and then with, that we look up to? Um, in today's model, uh, in today's panel, we made a conscious decision to not focus on those topics and to keep our focus primarily on payments and e-commerce. Um, and it's not because we don't uh, care about those issues or we don't think that it's important. On the contrary, we really believe strongly that those are very important issues and important topics. Uh, we love to talk about those issues too, but today we would like to be part of the solution. And what I mean by that is that we believe representation is important, uh, and that's why we have a panel of women leaders uh, talking about product and business solutions, and that hopefully all of you, both women and men in this room, can relate to. So I hope you all uh, enjoy this conversation and take a lot out of this. Um, so now um, I want to open it to our panelists. Um, if you could uh, introduce yourself, if you could share a little bit about your current role and also some of your background. Hi, everyone. Um, Marcy Campbell. Uh, I run worldwide sales for Braintree. So I have a team of about 125 people uh, around the globe who sell our solutions to all kinds of different customers, uh, small, medium business, and uh, large enterprises. Um, I am probably the oldest person on this panel with the least experience in payments. So <laughs> that is uh, what I bring to the table. Actually, um, I have a, <laughs> I have a, I, I've been with Braintree for a year. Um, part of that, I have deep expertise in tech sales. So I've been in sales my entire career. It's mostly been in enterprise sales. Uh, my last job was with a company called Cubal, which did big data as a service. Part of that, I was at Engine Yard and ran pretty much every division in Engine Yard, uh, which was Ruby on Rails on, on, uh, for developers, so deep into the development community. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to answer any questions around customers or around experience of joining a payments company. Hi. You, you, I'm just like you. I've been in payments for one year. My name is Manju. Um, I lead the partner and marketplaces product and engineering in PayPal. And <clears throat> I started my career as an engineering leader. I have been engineering leader for almost 14 years and moved to product because it always fascinated me in saying, hey, what is happening in the industry and how are we connecting with solving problems for the customers? And I moved to payments two years back, and I uh, took on one of the most interesting segments called partners. And in two years, I learned a little bit about payments. I'm hoping that I can share what I've learned in the two years. Um, looking forward to talking to you all. 
It's on. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Ashley. I am. I lead the commerce products at Venmo. So that includes a Venmo card, which is a Venmo backed debit card that we launched about two and a half months ago. Um, we also have a few integrations that allow PayPal merchants and Braintree merchants to offer Venmo as a payment method at checkout. And then we also um, have our purview is also over any sort of in-app uh, commerce experiences related to, to those things. So things like transaction history, splitting, sharing, that type of thing. Um, I came to uh, PayPal, Venmo, Braintree via an acquisition that PayPal made about three years ago, um, which was a mobile commerce startup based in Chicago. I am one of the Chicago people here. Um, and yeah, my, my prepayments, um, my background has primarily been um, at least in the product world in commerce. My name is Azita, and I've been with Braintree for a little over four years. Um, I'm on the business development team here, and um, I've really kind of over the course of the four years taken a couple of early stage products to market, one of which was the product that we acquired, um, which has morphed and pivoted several times over. Um, and so most recently, I say the bulk of my time has really been around launching a product called Braintree Extend. Um, it's a product that facilitates uh, secure payment sharing between partners for a variety of different use cases. Um, and most recently taking on some of the business efforts related to Venmo's go to market um, for merchants. So empowering merchants to be able to accept Venmo as a payment method. And then prior to Braintree, um, always in, in enterprise tech was at Google prior and then IBM before that. Hi everyone, I'm Archie. Um, I'm not going to talk about my age. Um, I froze at 21. So for all practical purposes, I'm 21, which means I'm allowed to drink. And um, I've um, been at Braintree for six years. Um, I started out at Braintree when we were opening up our office here on the West Coast. And um, it was a really small team back then here. And we were uh, working with a lot of our um, team, which was based out of Chicago. It was an interesting journey. What uh, drew me to Braintree was the premise of building payments products that made payments super easy. It enabled businesses to go and create these beautiful new interactions where payments faded into the background, where the interaction was of delight between customers and what they were buying and not what they were paying for. And um, that is where my journey began. Before that, over the course of my career, I've had um, several roles um, from being an engineer, being uh, a business analyst. Um, I then went on to doing product management and now heading product management for Braintree. Thank you. And, and my name is Mini Sangaswamy. I am a senior product manager here. And uh, I'm uh, one of the PMs in Archie's group. And I work in global payments. Um, so kind of to kick this off, um, I know you've all worked on products and solutions and have been instrumental in getting products to uh, customers, uh, both consumers and merchants. Um, can you talk about the most impactful feature uh, or product or solution uh, you have been involved in and share some uh, details around it? I'll open this to everyone. Are we going in any particular order? Okay, since everyone's very expectantly looking at me, <laughs> I am going to start talking about this. Um, so for me, like over the course um, of the time that I've been a brain tree, we've had some, we've had a run of really amazing products. But um, every time we fall back to the core premise of um, giving our merchants the capabilities that enable them to do beautiful things. And this comes down to, the, to our APIs, which, um, which are both very powerful in the experiences that uh, they create, but at the same time, so simplistic that um, you can do amazing things with them. Like you can, as a business that is based in one location, these APIs actually allow you to reach customers in any location through one integration. Um, they allow you to get as close to your customer as possible without having the back and forth um, across countries and across the network by some of the capabilities that we offer as tokenization. And it is 
and it is a concept of building blocks, right? You have a block and with that block, you can make a tower, you can make a house, you can do whatever. And so that block to me has been our APIs and tokenization and by far the most impactful thing that we do. Okay, <laughs> I'll go next. Um, so I, I alluded to this in my intro, but um, a product area that I've been managing for the last couple of years has been Braintree Extend. And um, I think why I, it's the most interesting, most maybe innovative thing that I've worked on is um, our CEO always likes to talk about how we are the commerce OS for our merchants. And more and more, the reality is commerce is evolving. What it was yesterday or, you know, it's not what it is today and not what it will be tomorrow. And I think we've seen that and we are also evolving and saying, okay, well, it's not just about a direct to consumer payment, very simple. Maybe you have to work with partners. Maybe there's some data elements that you need to be sharing sharing and oftentimes that might be payment and obviously the payment information needs to be is sensitive and needs to be um, very securely shared if it's going to be in a tokenized fashion and that's really what what is Braintree Extend it's like at its core it's really being able to facilitate those partnerships and obviously um, keeping the user's data as safe as possible um, but powering some really cool experiences and you know, a couple of examples to make it a little bit more concrete. Um, you know, what Uber's doing right now with its mobility platform, right? That they have a platform that is not just about ride sharing, but a platform that potentially you could come to for all of your different types of transportation needs, but they're doing that through partnerships. And so of course, again, it's gonna come back to how, what type of data needs to be shared and how do they do that? And, you know, really proud to say that Braintree Extend is, is behind a lot of those partnerships from a payments perspective. So going down the line, um, I would say certainly in, in, you know, in the more recent things that I've worked on, the most impactful thing that we've done or that I've, that I've worked on has been Venmo card. Um, a couple of things related to that. I think one, the getting out the door, I don't think I fully realized until we started to get it into people's hands how and you know how much demand they would there would be and how excited people would be about it. I think the idea of you know there are and, and something that we've heard from our users is that you know they think about um, the money that they have in Venmo or their balance really as you know as their fund money um, and giving them the tools to really be able to spend that anywhere, not just transfer it out into their bank account has been really, um, really powerful and really exciting. I think the other part about it, just to get like a little lofty, um, that's exciting is that just, you know, with this product, releasing this product, we've really been able to sort of expand, like completely blow up in, in a good way and expand, uh, expand the idea of what Venmo is. Um, and what Venmo can be for our users. So it's it's interesting, and I think it's always interesting putting a product out into the market, seeing what your users will do with it that you absolutely did not expect. Um, so one, you know, sort of one use case that we think about a lot of Venmo is really centered around, is really centered around post-purchase, like what happens after the purchase, around splitting, because that's what a lot of people are doing after the fact, um, just, you know, with Peter, like, um, in those P2P payments. So essentially, oh, we went out for drinks and paying, you know, paying my friend back like after the fact, or we went out to brunch and paying them back after the fact. With the card, uh, interestingly, what we started to see was people prepaying before money even left their account. So there would never be a time period where they were out of money. We heard one story during user testing, I love the story of um, uh, a woman knew that her boyfriend was looking for some, some art, like a piece of art or in a particular place um, in his apartment. She was at, an, she was at an, an art fair. She took a photo. She's like, oh, I see this great piece. She took a photo of the piece. She said, hey, do you want this? He said, yes. He Venmoed her the money. She paid for it with her debit card. The end. So like that kind of a thing, which is like the prepayment like use case that we never really thought about. Um, that's really exciting when you can give your users a tool uh, to do things that you would never even think of. And that's what makes this job super fun, I think. So in PayPal, we just um, worked on a product called PayPal for marketplaces. So one thing why I'm very, it was an interesting journey for us to do it. And we launched the product and we had 
customers come in to say, hey, how are they using it? What is the impact it had? Um, one of the you know one of the interesting facts about the marketplace product was PayPal releases. PayPal has how many of you guys know how many products PayPal have? Yeah, even I don't know <laughs> because there are plenty of them. And what we did was we looked at it and said, how do we bring together a bundle which is focused on a segment and not look at one of like 20, oh, here is your package, go figure out how to do this for you, running your business. So um, we had an interesting panel afterwards to, with some of the customers coming in and saying, how are they using it and what impact this had? And one of these marketplace customers came in and said, you have no idea how much money I was able to save because I used the product. Because there was so much losses on my uh, business before that it was not even sustaining the business. So for me, hearing that you guys saved my business is, is a great story. And in, in conjunction with that, as we developed the product, we said we looked around PayPal, Venmo, and everywhere, and Braintree, and said, how do we bring the best of all things we can come together and offer something for a cent? So we are in the process of working on the best product ever. We are, <laughs> I keep saying we have, none, we have not done our best product ever. It's always coming, right? The best product ever is always in the, in the making. Um, but in currently, I would say we are bringing something the best of, taking the best of PayPal and Braintree. Braintree brings the best of the developer experience and PayPal brings the best of the payment processing. So we are bringing a product that is coming together and we are so excited. It's already live in a couple of pilots and that I would say is my excitement that Mercy is gonna help us go. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it's funny because coming from a sales perspective and um, you know, I run sales and accounts. So I, I have pre and post. So if I sell you something, it better work, right? Because <laughs> I own that. So, um, you know, when I think across, when I listen to everybody on the panel and I hear about, you know, the elegant APIs and our SDKs and our BT Extend and the Venmo products and the marketplace product, you know, I've been involved with those conversations on the front end. And a lot of times the conversations that we have are around features and functionality. You know, OneTouch offers elegant conversion opportunities for our customers. And that's very exciting. But to be honest with you, the most exciting conversations that I have around the business models that people can use with all of these different tools. And so, you know, I was at a prospect the other day, I thought we were closing a contract and there were 11 people in the room, in this tiny little room, and they wanted to talk about the future. And they wanted to talk about payments, laying this payments infrastructure as a way to grow their business. And that conversation was unique. It was about how do they enable their users to go from, you know, renting something that, that would give them transportation to actually ending up being part of a consumer experience at a local store. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is really exciting. And I think that's what gets me around payments and, and around joining Braintree because I think it's endless possibilities and I think payments and e-commerce is morphing over the next couple of years. And I think that our customers and our merchants are gonna tell us what it is. I always find it funny when I, I always ask the Uber drivers, like, how long have you been riding for Uber? And, you know, I'm like, do you know that we're facilitating this? And they're like, no. <laughs> and then my kids are like, I love Venmo. I'm like, well, that's PayPal. They're like, it is, <laughs> right? So, you know, but um, honestly, I think that's the, that's what gets me up in the morning is being able to talk to different customers and accounts about how they're using this technology to further their business and further commerce. I love the pride and the passion that you all shared around, you know, the solutions that you've built. And this is why I said we're payment geeks, right? I mean, we talk about this and we get really excited. So before we jump into the next question, I wanted to kind of, you know, lay out the structure. Uh, we're structuring this so that like, this question was open to all. Um, so the next few questions, we'll kind of structure it so that it's targeted to a couple of you. Um, and, um, Manju, I know you talked about marketplaces. So I know it's, uh, it's no secret, everyone knows that the gig, gig economy has seen the emergence in the last few years. There's uh, new industries have been redefined, transportation, hospitality has been redefined by this. 
there are companies like Etsy, Uber, Airbnb, who have a buyer and a seller. In case of Uber, drivers and you know, riders, or Airbnb, there's owners and travelers. And it's enabled a two-sided marketplace. Uh, so it's, it's a question for both Azita and Manju. Uh, what are some of the interesting payment problems that you see that are unique to this area? And what untapped opportunities do you think exist? So I was reading about the gig economy and what does it bring to the table. One thing we, uh, what I realized is that 73%, I re read it from a Forrester report, 73% of the um, gig workers leave the marketplace because of payment problems. That's a huge number. 73% leave because uh, um, payment problems. And the reason what they said about it is that we think about marketplace in the traditional way. So it's businesses or small uh, sole prop. Whereas gig econ economy, what you are looking at is a person that payment is so critical for their day-to-day -day life. So what are the important opportunity we have ahead is we are all payment experts and we, this is a payment economy and we know how to do this. Um, we, what, what they want is flexible payment options. So give me flexibility. Around 40% of um, gig workers are not bank. They are unbanked people. So give me options on where, where should you pay? How will I get my money? Give me uh, openness to how do you show me how much money I got, how many, uh, how many fees I paid, and there is no, uh, there is no um, option for any error in your reporting. You, I, you can't delay my payments because this is like delaying my W-2. And so opportunity is so much if you look at that economy and say, how do we serve this segment? Uh, and there are new models and verticals coming up on a daily basis. That's what I see, right? There are so many, like how many new task rabbit would exist? I'm like, <laughs> right. what is this? Um, you know, big companies are going after this. Like the, uh, even Facebook, uh, you look at, they are taking advantage of gig economy. Like you see the house cleaning service or daycare service. Um, so it is growing. There's tremendous opportunities for us to think about payment in a different way. Yeah, building on that, I think um, what's really interesting about some of these marketplaces that you've talked about is they start having one particular product or service. Let's take Airbnb, lodging, right? Like that's really like the, the service that they're providing. And as they get to a certain scale, they nail that. And then they're like, well, but what else can I offer, right? They're always looking to add on. Like what else can I do to engage the user? What other value added services could I provide? Uh, and oftentimes the payments tends to be the tricky part because they wanna be able to surface up partner goods and services um, at the right time, right place to their consumers, but then it starts to break down on the payment side, it's too tricky. Um, they don't wanna increase their PCI scope. And you know we've, we're seeing that at Airbnb. I gave that example about Uber and its mobility platform, very similar, but I think that's, um, there's an opportunity there to be able to do this via partnership, not have to go and create those services and use tools like Braintree Extend to be able to facilitate that, right? I mean, um, I think that's kind of going back to like why I think that's so cool. It's like, it's, it's kind of this niche service, right? Um, and there's a lot of other types of business problems that they have and, and you know, you, having that kind of versatile set of APIs, um, I think is, is pretty, is helpful. Thank you. Um, so we've kind of talked about, you know, one of the trends, gig economy and marketplaces. So I want to touch on something else, another trend. So we uh, uh, talk about uh, how people buy via social networking and social uh, communication platforms. Um, and those platforms offer a compelling vehicle for merchants or businesses uh, to find targeted users. Um, so from your vantage point, and I'm kind of uh, posing this question to uh, Marcy and Manju, from your point of view, um, how are uh, payments teams and platforms enabling this for their merchants? Um, and on the other hand, as a business owner, how can one uh, effectively sell on all of these channels? So um, Marketplaces are growing tremendously. Everywhere, uh, every day there is a new marketplace coming. And I heard there are, 
there are around 3,500 marketplaces just in US itself, um, uh, which are selling goods, uh, goods, not services, goods based. Um, so how and social social commerce is really it's not it's not you are going to to eBay anymore. It's not you are going to eBay to buy something. You are browsing around in Instagram and you are seeing a nice dress and you're like, oh, there is something I can click and it goes to the store. And, and that is business. That is how it is growing right now. And so I, I love this, right? Instagram is my, like, oh, <laughs> oh shop, shop, shop. <laughs> oh, nice shoes. <laughs> so for, for, uh, for, for, for when we look at how do we grow these businesses, wherever the customer is, wherever you are, how do we make that relevant in that context? And how are we driving that in everything we do? Um, is, is, is something we can do. Now, on, on PayPal side, if I can talk about how PayPal is thinking about it, we are saying how do we enable, if you, you know, PayPal is a very strong uh, identity brand. And we, how can you enable, if you're a seller on PayPal, we help you to go or go sell your stuff on a, an Etsy or an eBay or wherever you want to go. And, and that helps you to be present wherever the things are moving. And, um, I, I, I was reading about Facebook and Instagram. They are, the shopping is moving to those social channels. Sure. Yeah, I think from a business perspective, when you think about using social channels and starting to use that uh, as an avenue to reach new consumers, you have to think about two things. One is the value and strength of what relationships bring. So the idea of, you know, it used to be when we had the first marketplaces out there that, and I know this to be true because I worked with the opinions, is that we would write opinions and put them up on Amazon so that people would look at the products. But now it's not really a recommendation engine anymore. It's really a live feed on Instagram watching what your friends have. And I think that is something that businesses have to be very, very aware of. I also think that when we talk to our um, we talk to our merchants, the things they care about, right? They care about customer conversion. They care about operational efficiency and elegance, right? They care about reduced risk and they care about adding revenue. And social networks have to offer all four of those things for it to be relevant in their in their space. They have to understand that when they click through, when someone clicks through a Instagram and they get to a, um, a third party where they can actually purchase something that it has to be an elegant experience. And otherwise people are just, you know, you're just not gonna spend the time. We're starting to live in a world where if it takes seconds to get through a purchase, you know, you're gonna walk away. Because right. you might change your mind, right? And see something on the next picture, right? So um, yeah, I think that's, you have to be very aware. And we're talking to a lot of merchants nowadays that are aware of like, they wanna know, the value of that. And I think some of the expertise that Braintree brings to bear is, is really having 35,000 customers that really can talk about what the experiences are in social. So it's been very interesting. I, I love hearing how we're, uh, we could optimize for the selling via those uh, channels. And um, Manju, I, I don't think you're alone in like people who buy a lot <laughs> uh, from Instagram or Facebook. I think it's definitely the trend going that way. Um, and the more integrated these experiences become, the more seamless the, the payment start to get as well. And I think sometimes, one thing I want to add is sometimes payments has to work. Yeah. It has to work. Don't make fuss about it. It's just, you know, it's the rail that has to work. And that I think when we think about, you know, selling on these platforms, et cetera, if this becomes a hiccup, you lose that business. I, I, I think you hit the nail uh, on that, uh, with that. Uh, it's something that everyone takes for granted, that it would just automatically work. Those of who work in payments, we know like all the blood and sweat that goes into just making it work. Uh, but that's like a given expectation from both consumers and merchants. Um, so let's talk about some of the other channels. Um, and I'm gonna uh, you know, uh, focus this next question on Archie, you and Archie. Um, 
So we've talked about e-commerce a lot. Um, e-commerce is growing at an astonishing rate. Everyone knows that. Uh, we see new businesses and business models that are 100% online nowadays as well. On the other hand, e-commerce was just 13% of the overall commerce activity over the last year, which means that 87% of commerce activity is still happening in physical store. Um, so what kind of opportunities do you think exist uh, to create better uh, buying experiences for consumers across multiple channels? And uh, what kind of innovation do you think are going to happen in this omni-channel experience? So um, I think a lot of times what happens is when, um, when we think about these interactions, we think about them as two separate things. We think about them as buying online versus buying in store. But the way the world around us is evolving, it almost like these experiences are going to merge and they are going to overlap. And so what we already see happening is this desire to, um, it's natural as a buyer, I wanna go online and shop, but I want to get the best deal and so I don't wanna pay for shipping which means if there is a store that can allow me to come in store and pick this up, that is a great experience for me and it is a great experience for the store because they um, manage their inventory and shipping costs much better. At the same time, when I'm going into the store, um, I don't want it to be an experience where um, I have to remember to carry my card. I know we can, um, we can shop with the phone, but Imagine that you don't have anything on you at that point. You're going for a run and you realize that, hey, you're running out of milk or for whatever reason, your shoes are broken, you need new running shoes. <laughs> and you can simply just walk into a store and buy the shoes you want without anything on you and your payment happens. And that kind of um, experience, I think, is yet to come. And for a lot of us who are in payments, that is going to be the challenge of how do we think about building capabilities that are not restricted to a single farm, that can actually go through multiple farms, multiple channels, as seamlessly as, um, as our identities do. I would agree with that. I think, I think we're in the middle of this transition. I don't think people have figured it out yet. I think you hear buy, buy online, return in store, buy in store, return on, you know, you don't return online, but buy, return in store. Um, but I think the idea is that um, the seamless integration of that experience, you know, I'm sitting waiting for my son to get done with his schooling and I'm looking through dresses and I stop off at Macy's and I buy the dress I saw online, right? Like those kinds of things are happening more and more. And so I think that that's the challenge we have as payments experts on how to do that. And then also how do we connect the buying purchases from store to store, right? So how do, I, how do you have like things and then how do you have them delivered to your home? And then you see, you know, a ton of different opportunities with companies that do, they, they start in one domain and they start to deliver another, right? So if you have Uber and Uber Eats, right? You start to have a delivery service, but underlying that is really a payments infrastructure. And I think that companies that don't think about payments as a platform, and it's something that they can build over time and they don't make the right decisions and they look at it as sort of components that they slap together, I think are looking at it incorrectly because we're gonna solve these really big problems and our, our, we're gonna see new business models that are gonna drive everybody forward. Yeah, I think it's gonna be very important for businesses because businesses can't solve this themselves. Like they don't treat you as someone, as a different person who shops online and a different person who comes to the store. They want to know you and have a unique relationship with you. Yeah, I think that's the other piece that's really getting interesting here is data. So I came from a big data as a service platform where it was self-service analytics. And what I saw was companies trying to figure out how I can get more data around their consumers. People want to know who I am and what I buy and how I buy, you know, that, and they want to know, you know, what you frequent so they can offer you things when you walk into that store. So contextual commerce, I don't know that it's actually happened in full blown yet, but I think there's an opportunity in front of us to figure it out. Someone's gonna figure out how to do this right. And when they do, it's gonna take off. I'm sure it'll be us. 
<laughs> of course. Um, and I can't wait for the future where I don't have to carry like my giant uh, phone with all the credit cards in the cover tugged in and be like, oh, I really need this thing, which I lose multiple times during the day and just go and like buy stuff. Um, looking forward to that future. Um, so let's talk more about the integration of offline and online. Uh, and uh, so Azita and Ashley, my next question uh, to you. And it's a kind of a true prompt question. So Ashley, you talked about uh, the Venmo debit card. Um, we, know, we know Venmo has been a very sticky product and has very high level of engagement, especially with Millennium. Um, and also that you launched the debit card, I think you said two and a half months ago. Um, so how has the addition of the debit card contributed to the overall customer experience stickiness? I think you shared, like, that the story that you shared was, like, such a uh, perfect, like, as, the, as a product manager, that's what you want to hear from your customers. Um, but have you seen any changes in the user behavior? Um, and the second strong question is, um, from the, we, we've seen the value of Venmo for consumers. What is the value of Venmo for, for merchants? Great question. Um, so in terms of user behavior, I talked a little bit about sort of unexpected user behavior that we saw when we launched this, which was super exciting for us. Um, the other thing that we've, we've heard and we've seen is, um, I did mention this before about, you know, Venmo users thinking about their balance in a particular way and thinking about it as, you know, their fund money. One thing that we kept hearing from card users again and again was this idea that they were, they were being more proactive and more mindful of the balance that they had. So like in the past, you've definitely heard, and you can, you can Google this and like read quotes from people that say, it's kind of like uh, sometimes when no balance for people, it's kind of like, oh, I found like 20 bucks in my back pocket that I totally didn't realize was there. So people will say things like, oh, I had this Venmo balance. I didn't realize it was there and total surprise, delight. Um, but I think now what you're seeing with a mechanism um, for people to, instead of just transferring it out or just having it like, you know, kind of move back and forth within the ecosystem, having another way to use it, people are being more mindful about, um, about that balance. And uh, people are, are saying like, I'm trying to keep that. So they're using it, like they're more proactively using it as a, as, as a budgeting tool. Um, not necessarily like, for their whole, you know, for every everything that's going on in their lives. But again, you know, like for that fun money. So wanting to say, like if they say to themselves, I have this amount of money to spend this month and this is what I'm gonna spend and it's in here and I know once it's done, I can stop and I've had a really great month um, or week or whatever. Um, we're starting to see that. And so I think that's the way, I don't know that it's, it's, it's changed, I don't know whether it's changed user behavior, but I think it's sort of changed the paradigm, um, you know, Everyone's already, or not everyone, but a lot of people are already using Venmo, and it is a very sticky product. Um, but but that idea of the balance not becoming just, not being just something that you happen to have, but something you're interested in keeping because it's valuable to you, because you can use it in a different way than you could before. That's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing we are enabling uh, humors not to just spend money, but also think about it from a very conscious perspective of how can they not spend it, yeah. a lot of it as well. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's totally cool. <laughs> um, so I think the question was was around like what type of value, right, are we bringing? So um, I think Venmo is just so much more than, than a wallet, right? And I think when we talk to our users, they talk about the joy and delight when they use Venmo, right? And if anybody has used Venmo, you know, like you, it's, it's a fun experience, right? It takes like kind of the pain and the awkwardness out of payments. And I think we're really trying to bring that to merchants and allow them to tap into it um, and do a little bit more. I think um, 
again, kind of going back to like Venmo being more than a wallet. I think a lot of people look at wallets and they say, okay, well, different alternative payment methods, the ease, convenience, like, you know, can, um, security and trust, which Venmo does give, but there's this very unique experience with Venmo that there's a post-purchase experience, right? It's not just about the ease of getting through that transaction. It continues to live on, right? When the user comes to their app, they see what they've bought. Maybe they can even split that right, which oftentimes we are doing anyways offline, so make it a little bit easier to do, and then also share something about it, right? It's, it's an experience, not just a transaction. Share that with the world, and then, you know, for the merchants, obviously, they now, that, that, that purchase lives on. It's kind of putting your money where, where your mouth is, like really, you know, like in action. And so it really, you know, it's a, it's a kind of organic brand awareness um, by showing up in the Venmo feed, which is a very valuable feed. Our users are incredibly engaged. Stats are something like, you know, users are coming to the app two or three times a week to look at the feed, whereas they're transacting less frequently, right? Um, so it kind of speaks to that value. And that's what we're trying to bring is like that Venmo magic that's already kind of just been created through the P2P platform and extend that to the merchants. Thank you. I, I love that we're spreading the Venmo magic. <laughs> um, so I know that more than 50% of audience today are product managers, and most, if not all, are in product or engineering in some capacity. Um, so I wanted to kind of take uh, the next question about looking at payment from a product perspective. So uh, Archie and Ashley, the next question's for you. Um, as PM leaders in Braintree and Venmo, uh, what are some of the unique considerations that you take into account when building in a product? So my belief is, you know, that even though Braintree is largely B2B, right, we work, our products are for businesses who want to sell something to customers. But we have a very personal relationship with customers. And the reason I say that is because you, you can't get more personal other than dealing with money. This is someone's money going out of their pocket. Yes, you could if, if you were matching them up to like on the dating <laughs> side, but let's not go there. But um, for the sake of argument, right, payments is personal. And therefore, um, because someone's money is involved, there are a lot of considerations that go into building a payments product. We want to create these beautiful experiences. We want to enable that. We want to move fast. There's agility involved. But we have to keep two critical things in mind. One is security. You can't mess with someone's money. Like they could be counting on it to pay their bills. And the other part of it is being able to do it at scale because the last thing that you need is that the businesses that you're powering then come back and tell you that, oh, we had this important thing or important customers we had to reach, but we kind of dropped money on the floor because you were not up. So building uh, payments products with scale and security are things that go into every little detail in the way we think about problems. Like we want to match security and scale with delight. And that is when our products hit the sweet spot. That was an awesome answer. <laughs> um, I, I mean, to, to echo that, I think that you just have to be, you have to be really careful. So it's, 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 there's a really strong tension um, between moving really fast and you know being biased toward getting things out there and getting things in the hands of users, but it has to be, it has to be right um, because, because it's people's money. And I think that like you, you can, like I feel that, I'm kind of squinching up like this because it's like, oh, you know, I'm like, we need to be moving faster. I always feel that way. I always want to be moving faster. Um, and, you know, with there are certain there are things, you know, with as many users as we do have, like if we can get things out faster, we can get a signal faster and understand if like what we're doing is valuable in a very like visceral way. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, whatever, whatever the thing is, um, we just have to be, in, anytime there's money movement involved, we just have to be really, really precise. Yeah. Cool. Um, you know, talking about moving faster, we've uh, talked a lot about what are, you know, what's going on now, right? Um, I want to switch the gears and kind of throw this out to you. Um, what do you think will happen in five years from now? What is your wild prediction about how payment 
uh, fully by default. Okay. Remake. Mini. <laughs> That's what we need to do. Uh, when I think about it, no wallets. Is it a good dream to have? Right? No wallets. I would like to have no phones as well. It's like, you know, no phones, no wallets. Can be like, yeah, 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 something. Something has to happen. I don't know where it is, but it has to happen. That That's one thing um, where it is moving. Um, enabling anybody to do business with anybody else. Another way of at it. Let's, I have only two. Yeah, I think, you, I think in, in five years, people will be looking at payments as communication. So it will be sort of in the underlying infrastructure or how people interact with one another. And I think it, you know, in, in uh, looking at my Nirvana, it's just that it's something you don't think about, right? You just order an Uber and you order dinner and you go get an airplane ticket and you show up and you know you just run through your regular day and it's a very seamless experience no matter how many different payment systems you're going through or how many different merchants that you are working with. So, wildest was like the operative word here right so that's the story we're going to stick with. So um, so for context for everyone here, a little bit more background on me. Um, I'm an extreme introvert. So hu human beings are not my thing. And malls and um, stores like overwhelm me deeply. Like you can make me mine through any amount of data, figure out patterns, traverse the graph, but do not send me to a store randomly to buy stuff, <laughs> right? Like that I cannot do. So for me, um, the wildest things that we could be doing with payments is actually a combination of identity, AI, and security. And the reason I pick these three is because um, I, let's imagine this scenario. I wake up one day and um, I have a holiday party that is coming. I need to buy a dress for this holiday party. And the said person is not going to go to the store to buy the dress. Now, um, what I do do is, um, I'm, I go to this yoga class and I don't carry anything to the class. It's like flip flops in your yoga mat. There's no phone, there's no card. So clearly no purchasing is happening. But my yoga class is in this neighborhood and inside this mall that has the best stores that you can possibly imagine. Now think that my house, which is connected with all of these devices, um, my husband works at Amazon, so we definitely rely on Alexa a lot. I wake up in the morning and say, Alexa, I need a dress for the holiday party. Now, Alexa has my calendar, knows I'm looking for my dress, has my secure payment credentials because I have access to a wallet. Maybe PayPal is powering the payments there. One day, who knows, five years, anything can happen, right? And when I go to my yoga class, this store already knows that I'm looking for this perfect dress. They also know that I need perfect shoes and bags to go with it. And I'm walking in and they know I'm in the vicinity because they can figure out who I am. There is face IDs, there's rec recognition, there's identity. Now, if they can very deterministically figure out who I am, what I'm looking for, get me to pay for it, and match up my preferences of buying based on past data through all the AI together, imagine the amount of conversions they can get out of a yoga class. <laughs> so that, I think, is the future where we are heading. Totally. Everyone feels great after yoga class. If you want to add. <laughs> all right. Um, so at this point, I would actually love to open it to all of you and see if you have uh, any questions uh, to the panelists. Testing, sure. testing. Yeah, let me hold Hi guys, good evening. Thank you for a really great panel. Um, two questions. Um, firstly, some of the things you mentioned about the future of payments that are really happening in China. I actually lived in China for three and a half years. So, you know, buying Starbucks and buying a plane ticket and buying food with one tap of the button on WeChat Pay or AliChat Pay is pretty much normal life for us. What have you learned from China and how are you going to integrate that into PayPal and or Braintree? Okay, I'm not sure I can talk about PayPal and uh, my organization, Braintree, we're not selling in China at this point. 
Um, but I was an entrepreneur in residence for a venture firm here years back, years back. Um, and um, what we were, when we were talking uh, to uh, our Japanese partners, they were coming in and showing us these applications that were on their phones that would let them identify um, when they drove by a palace or a store. It was just amazing. It was 10 years uh, ahead. And I think one of the things uh, when we were starting to look at, like, when was 3G going to be adopted? Like I said, this was years back. Um, we were looking at, like, the infrastructure that we had laid out for the telecommunication systems in the U.S. were so much more advanced than what they had in the Asian countries that the Asian companies actually hopped us in terms of, in terms of laying out the wireless. So they were able to take advantage of some of the wireless economies and the wireless systems that we're talking about adopting in the US right now. So I think that's in some places we're, we're way behind because they didn't have the opportunity to lay wire, lay, lay fiber, right? And so um, it's been an interesting opportunity for us from, from a Braintree perspective. I'm really interested in India, really interested in what we can do in Asia. I think that is an emerging economy for us and I think that we can learn a lot. They, they buy differently. They think about uh, convenience differently. So just uh, it's my take. I can talk a little bit about what PayPal is thinking of in China and, and empowering the mobile economy quite a, quite a bit. Um, we have seen uh, WeChat pace of the world becoming the, uh, you know, it's norm. It's the, the way we look at. And PayPal is working with some of these um, you know, WhatsApp and things like that, to say how do we become a part of that? We are part of that that system, and we are part of the payment option in, in these areas where, you know, PayPal uh, can be, and enable even uh, people who come from U.S. going to China to do things without having to hop over and say, oh, my, my app doesn't work anymore. Um, and things like that. So uh, we are looking at some more of those things as we are uh, evolving how PayPal is changing uh, as well. And, and the other thing is, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware, but PayPal is also already a part of uh, AliExpress and PayPal processes payments on AliExpress. So some of these things are happening uh, uh, in China to, to be a part of that Take advantage of it uh, and really see how how do we innovate in that uh, in that market. Okay, so we briefly discussed China. So, what about your plans for Africa? Um, I actually live in Lagos, Nigeria currently, and PayPal, for example, we're not actually as a merchant, we're not actually able to accept local African currencies on PayPal. What are your plans for emerging markets in Africa in particular, where e-commerce is so nascent, but it's a really growing economy? So that um, Africa, Africa is um, not in our current roadmap for 2018, that I know, but we do cross-border uh, trades and CBT, um, but a lot of other um, emerging markets like Brazil, uh, Mexico, um, Thailand, India, we are spending a lot of effort and energy into how do we grow and help these economies grow and um, to, to, to innovate there. So local acquiring, how do we build relationships? Uh, India is already in, um, we are looking at other places as well. I want to say one other thing about the about WeChat. Um, I also lived in China during the time that WeChat was just sort of coming up, um, 2011, 2012. And I think that the thing that's interesting to me about WeChat, um, outside of the payments piece of it, is that the way that it started and what it was and what it's become, like it, the way that it started and the hard part, it seems, and I'm vastly oversimplifying, but was getting users on the network. So just getting the people there. And so then when I think about, you know, WeChat has had explosive growth for many reasons. Um, amazing, like, in, like amazing technology, amazing experiences, but, you know, also in 
also in a country where it is like the de facto, like it has become the de facto choice. But like just that idea of getting people there was really the hardest part. And then I look at, I look at Venmo and kind of have seen, you look at that growth over the years and, and look at then sort of on the flip side, what other competitors are trying to do who may have been in merchant payments first, who are now getting into P2P payments and trying to build, trying to build like the, the people network part of it later. Um, that's really, really hard to do. So just like sort of selfishly thinking out loud, um, it, it makes me feel really positive on at least where the competitive advantage that Venmo has today in terms of that network. Um, really, like I, f I feel very strongly that the, the competitive differentiator that we have, um, there are other things like going on in the app experience as well, like in terms of, you know, things that are different and make it different than a normal payment method, but it's also really our users. And that is like, um, that's, that's just really difficult to do. So I think like looking at WeChat as an example of, you know, the types of technology and where things are going um, or really where things are, I think, I think is really good to do. But I think that to me, like the biggest lesson, to me, the, the biggest lesson there is just like, once, once you have the people, you can kind of take your business or app or technology really in any direction you want to and make money. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Anu, uh, ex-PayPal, uh, and now in the payment terminal world. Uh, so I get to see a different side of the buyer experience. So Marcy, to your question of contextual commerce or to your uh, insight on integrated commerce or omnichannel commerce, where should data reside, really? Should it reside on the payment terminal? Should it reside on the payment platform? Should it reside with the merchant? Should it reside in the digital wallets? Should it reside on the device like Alexa or Echo? Because that's something that, at least from my perspective, we all try to constantly brainstorm. And that is what, at the end of the day, a merchant really wants to grow or scale their business. So, so. Would love to hear your, your thoughts on where this data should really reside and how it will shape in the next five years, how, how this, this thing will shape or scale. Thank you. So I'm not technical, right? I'm in sales and accounts. Um, I lived in the data world for three years. At my last company, the guys who built the Facebook data platform started a company called Cubal. There were 30 people when I joined and 300 when I left because Juan came calling here. The company's doing really well still. Um, and I'm a big advocate of the cloud because I've been working with Amazon since they had five salespeople in Amazon, right? Um, and so I believe that everything is moving to the cloud. I believe that you know the cloud is getting safer and safer and that the data should reside in the cloud and be accessible and secure for the merchants to access it, that the merchants own that data. Yeah, well, that's another question. I'll let I'll, I'll actually let Archie answer that one. <laughs> nice pass, Marcy. Um, and then firstly, thank you for your patience. You know, you're waiting for a bit there uh, for the question. Uh, I think, in my opinion, PayPal um, should reside everywhere, right? Like you cannot. The moment you start um, as a payments company, especially when you start creating these boxes for yourself that should we reside in the payments platform? Should we reside in the point of sale terminal? Should we uh, reside online? Um, we are basically taking the premise of complexity and instead of absorbing the complexity from our businesses, we are pushing it to the businesses, we are pushing it to the consumers. Because at the end of the day, a business who is selling doesn't actually care where PayPal resides. What they want is a way to get the consumer to buy. And if a consumer has a way, whether they are doing it with their watch, whether they are signing into PayPal, if a point of sale system is available, whether they are swiping their cards, if their transaction can go securely without compromising the identity, I think that is going to be the key. And I, um, I actually echo what Marcy is saying. A lot of what we will have to do is move to the cloud. And if we want to be able to actually serve these customers at the speed at which they are expecting. Like, how many people here have to wait and check out lines at Safeway? Like, for whatever reason, they never have all the counters open, right? Like, <laughs> you, 
just baffles me. The 10 counters, two are open. Very true. <laughs> Yeah, and so, like, they want the speed, and we can't get that speed. Like, sure, traditionally, we opened up data set, data centers everywhere, built it up to get closer to uh, the customers of our merchants. But if we want to expand to every place in the world, we can't grow at that scale by managing our infrastructure. We have to go to the cloud. And the cloud offerings have evolved to an extent where they are reliable, they're scalable, they have a bigger footprint. So that would be my. Thank you. We'll we'll take um, let's see, one final question and then possibly. Hi. Uh, the... Hi. We'll we'll take we'll take a few more questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sure. Hi. My name is Jasmine. Um, I'm from PayPal. This question is for Ashley. Um, I would love to hear something that Vemo is. You know, what's next for Vemo, both from a P2P space as well as outside of P2P, and um, how do you continue to grow your user base as you tackle the new frontiers? Wow, okay. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, uh, one thing that we've seen happen, so I'll, I'll address the second question first. Uh, one thing that we have seen happen, and one thing we have thought a lot about um, is is the life cycle uh, not the life cycle but sort of you know the stages that our users are going through so a lot of people um you know we now have users who have been using venmo for a very long time and they started at one stage in their life when you know they were um you know they were they were chipping in or paying friends back for beer and now they might be at a stage where they're paying a babysitter you know, to babysit their kids. And so there's always going to be, um, you know, Venmo is, is, is really is a thing that, or an app that people start to use in college. Um, and so there's always going to be like this new influx, I think, I hope, of users who, you know, find this to be really valuable. But I think the thing we always want to keep in mind is not just, not just how we grow those users. So they always, you know, they always seem to come and they come in and that's great and wonderful, but also what tools can we give to our existing users to make sure that we're growing with them? So, you know, more than just, I would say like or much more than just sort of the, the things that make Venmo fun. Um, you know, people always talk about Venmo and emojis and the payment note and that's all fun and that's, that's really great too. But you know, as um, our users have have gotten more financially savvy or more sophisticated, um, or just think about their money differently, um, we want to make sure that you know that we're that we're there for that, and that we're sort of cognizant of that, um, and that we're you know able to give people you know financial products and capabilities that they're going to use throughout. And I think that's part of you know that's part of what. You know, in large part, that's part of what the debit card is, and sort of expanding, like, expanding this. But like, we're also thinking about, um, you know, you know, I talked a little bit about this before, um, but like, we're also starting to think about like, as people or as our users are telling us, we want ways, you know, to manage this balance, you know, more proactively instead of waiting for our friend to just pay us back, and you know, then we have the twenty bucks that we found in our back pocket type of feeling to, um, I really want to use this, you know, I really want to use this money as sort of a control for myself and how much I want to spend on certain things. So when I think about the future of where we're going, generally, that's, you know, that's sort of, that's not sort of, but that's, that's what I'm thinking of. And it's, you know, thematically, it's really just about how can we grow with our users? Um, because we, you know, we keep our users, and you know, Venmo becomes more and more valuable the longer people use it, um, because then they get their friends to come on, or whoever, or you know, whoever's in their lives. So like, it might be, you know, it might be the babysitter, it might be the dog walker, you know, it might be, you know, whomever um, that they're trying to pay, and you know, making sure that that we understand like fully what's happening there and that we don't lose them because they feel like, oh, this is, you know, this is, this is for 20 year olds, you know, I don't, you know, and I'm, you know, and I'm 35 now, so I don't need this anymore. That's not what we want. Hey, thank you. Um, so my question is around failure and, you know, individually and as a company, we grow much more when we learn from our failures. 
and when you learn from a failure it's not really a failure if there's anything you guys want to share about something that went horribly wrong what you all learned <laughs> uh, what you all learned from it uh, <laughs> Boy, okay. Um, you know, I have this. Uh, I have this story about my oldest son, who was a terrible baseball player. And um, when he was younger, he loved baseball, but he was really bad at it. And he was on the team that always lost. And I used to tell him after every game, I'm like, you know, when you lose, you learn. So after a couple of games, he's like, Mom, we must be smarter than any of the other teams, <laughs> right? So. Um, you know, I think the failure, fail, there's, two, there's two types of failures that you gotta be aware of. One is failure of execution, right? You can have some really good ideas and really poor execution. And that comes down to a failure of communications and also a failure of hiring the right people, right? Who are committed to getting a job done. Um, you know, we always say in, in I've been in uh, 11 startups and we, it's just fail fast, right? The idea is that you want to go as fast as you can, make decisions, and if they're the wrong decisions, then quickly iterate. Um, I'm not sure I've been here long enough from Braintree to say that I've had a massive failure. I think I've um, hired some of the wrong people maybe initially, but um, you know I've hired really right as well. Um, but I think that comes down to whether or not they're a fit in the culture or whether or not they're committed to the you know, the merchants that we have. Um, and you always have to look back at it and say, how much of that, like I've done a startup, I've done a number of startups that didn't work. And, and you have to sit down and say, what do I own, right? You put it on the board and you go, okay, so, you know, this was bad technology, bad timing, bad market, bad customers, you know, bad me, like, what do I own? Did I hire the right people? Was it the right timing? Did we get the right messages? And was the product market fit right? And the big thing is you can get, you know, I've been in companies where they build a beautiful product and they tell you to go sell it and there's no product market fit for what they're trying to do. And the companies that work is when you come back and you get back with the engineers and you're like, okay, I'm not getting any traction here, but I'm seeing a light of the tunnel on this other thing. And you morph what you have. And I think BT Extend was like really an example of that. Of, of taking and repackaging technology in a way that people really adopted it. But it was a learning from a failure. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, well, it's not like a failure because it's turned into a success. But initially when we launched this product, it was not called Braintree Extend. It was just called Contextual Commerce because that's how our first you know, big partner who adopted the tool was using it. We said, hey, this is cool. This is like definitely the future of commerce. So we went really hard to market with this contextual commerce offering and story and narrative, you know, went out, sold it and put it in, you know, kind of seeded it with some of our most strategic merchants. A year later, we looked at the adoption and we said, okay, let's like, let's go and look and see how exactly are these merchants using it. Come to find out, a, you know, a percentage is using it for contextual commerce, but the vast majority are actually using it for other different use cases. Start to double click, start to start talking with these merchants, because once it came in it, in-house as an API, kind of grew organically with new use cases. And we started to distill out kind of that there are two other key use cases um, that have nothing to do with contextual commerce, that have a totally different value prop narrative. And so that's really kind of what we learned is like, you know, we need to change that narrative. We need to be able to, to resonate with more merchants and we can if we just talk more explicitly to these other use cases and hence the need to really create a name that's not just contextual commerce kind of the functional use case um and and with that i think we've had a lot more success because now people know exactly what it means and what it can do and not just kind of narrowly focused on one aspect that we originally thought everybody would use the tool for i, I love the question by the way we've talked so much about like success and like opportunities and positives it's great to like even talk yeah, just to add to that, right? Like for me, um, it's sort of still related to success, but like the biggest failures that I've seen with some of the products that we've had, um, we definitely don't cross the security line, right? You never fail at security, <laughs> number one. But we've had cases where um, we've built the product and we didn't build it for success. And that in hindsight is the wrong thing to do because when you're building a product, 
you're like, okay, we need to get this out. We need to make sure that people are able to test it. People are able to give us feedback. At that time, you take, you choose, you make certain choices that you're like, oh, maybe I'm okay with a manual workaround for something. I'm okay with pe putting people to solve this one part of this product because I really want the feedback. But what you forget is like, you're not designed for success because very soon, if you've thought about your experience right, your product is going to become popular. And that time, no matter how many people you add, that's not going to be sufficient. So in a way, then you become your own bottleneck. And that is, we've had those situations, we've had cases where we have to be like, oh, we have to like, we're still in beta and it's gonna take us a long time to come to general availability for that reason. So I think not designing for success in hindsight has not been a great decision. Last question. Um, thank you, ladies. It was wonderful talking. My question is, um, in your careers and even going forward in the payments industry, you must have seen new trends, new technologies, and you will see in the future. So all you ladies as, as just like product leaders, how do you think about those technologies and how do you vet them or how do you think that these are the ones that we want to work on or some of them you don't want to. So as leaders, when you're trying to think about your teams and what they want to work, how, how does that thought process work? Yeah, I can start. Um, I, I, the one thing I've uh, decided is as leaders, I, I don't decide. I let the teams play and see what the pros and cons are. Because you never know what is good or uh, not till they try. So sometimes it helps quite a bit to say, go play with it. Let's see what advantage this has. If it's beneficial in some way, let's do pros and cons and decide what we want to do. And sometimes that works better because teams, we may not, we may not be where that close to technology or what the trends are moving as much as our teams. So some of the things, that's, that's how I think about it. Yeah, for me, it's like you try everything. And when, when I mean you try everything, it's not just you, I agree with Manju, like sometimes we won't scale if we are the actual ones, it's like about the team, but you try everything. It is better to try and decide that it didn't work rather than be left out and something becomes very popular and you've never tried it and then you're catching on. The cost of catching on is always very high. And so all the secret shoppers of the world unite for all <laughs> payment experiences. Great. One more? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so my question is actually uh, built up on the previous questions for the futures and technologies. I think everybody knows that blockchains is a lot of talking in the air right now. I wanted to be more specific on what do you see blockchain could be done in the payment marketplace and the payment space, and in what aspect that it will influence the user and the merchants. I can I can go. I I, I pay. Um, so. Uh, I mean, I have a slightly biased perspective here. I will admit that I'm a little old school. I like money to be real, like real money. I should be able to count it, even if it's in my bank account. So um, I think blockchains are great. There, there are two aspects of it. Um, I like one and I don't like the other. The part I don't like is the actual cryptocurrency aspect of it. Um, like I cannot get my head around the valuation and how money, hypothetical money, can be so much more valuable than real money. And then when you try to cash it out, it is, you're still getting the same real money. The other aspect of blockchains, which I think is pretty fascinating, is the network and the technology that was used to build it. And I think that as we see this evolve, we'll see evolution in both of those and they'll start forking off further and further, where the technology could actually potentially be used for connecting um, more traditional forms of payments like real money, like banking or um, car processing and networks. And there's a lot of potential there, which is not being explored. So for me, um, just my natural geekiness towards payments, I gravitate towards um, the evolution of what that network can do, not so much as the currency itself. I will have to 
to stick to that story. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the reason is um, in PayPal world, we, we haven't ventured into that um, as, as a payment method. Um, but the technology behind how we are connecting, uh, the connecting different people and economies is, is huge. And I think there is something to be said about that. We have one more question. Um, this question is open to all the panelists. Um, so today we talked about untapped opportunities and in, um, it's about servicing the underbanked people. The traditional reason that we can't service them is because of KYC and also um, anti-money laundry purpose. So like, I wanna know like, how does Braintree and Venmo and PayPal tackle this question like, or this challenge differently? Like just to, you know, will prepay solution solve this issue? Um, I was looking for, um... <laughs> oh yeah, there, <laughs> where is she? <laughs> I found her. You want to answer that one? Um, I can try. <laughs> so I, 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 there is a Come on. Um, all right. Um, hi guys, I'm Meghna. I'm a product leader in PayPal <laughs> and I actually work for the Consumer Financial Services Group. And part of the things we are working through, we actually serve the underbanked and the, um, um, the underserved uh, population across the globe. We try to build products for them. Uh, we, our team spent about a year in what we call discovery, where we talked around uh, seven countries around the world to different people and um, some very emotional conversations about money and how they manage it and how they can be part of the digital economy and really try to understand financial inclusiveness for them. So um, we're starting with the US as a test base for being able to launch a bunch of products in this area. Um, KYC is definitely a huge problem, but relatively easier in the United States than other countries. So we kind of, you know, cheated a little bit and started in the U.S. and experimenting and learning. But Mexico and um, some European countries are our next target areas. We, um, in the U.S., SSN, Social Security Number, and um, date of birth are important and part of your credit history are all important pieces of um, being part of the financial economy and of the digital economy. Uh, we are um, right now on the rails of using these existing pieces, but we are talking to a lot of um, nonprofits who serve these um, underbanked and the unserved in the US, and we're trying to understand from them how do they help these customers and really grow beyond using an SSN. So there are some um, <laughs> ideas that we are innovating on in our group. Um, so that people are not international students. I mean, there are a whole bunch of things where SSN is not possible, but there are banks and communities out there helping these people somehow, right? They're doing KYC somehow, they're helping them out and we're trying to learn from them. And we have complete intentions of bringing those innovations into PayPal and really help this, um, this user base get access to their own money in a much easier and um, low fees and low cost way. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. So uh, I know that we all want to keep going, but I want to remind, remind people that this is not the end. We have the networking part of the evening. And if you have any more questions and we couldn't get to your questions, you could certainly you know, uh, stay back and ask. You'll have an opportunity to ask the panelists uh, more questions. Uh, but thank you so much. There was like so much enthusiasm in the room, uh, so much curiosity in the room that you know I was really overwhelmed with it. Because um, when I was, you know, we're planning the panel, we're like, oh my god, what if we don't get questions? Do we have like, uh, like we had, I had like backup questions, right? <laughs> backup questions planned. So you all like completely took out the need for it. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for our panelists who were able to stay back and answer those questions. So before we wrap, um, on behalf of the panelists, Minnie, I want to thank you as well as all of the organizers because um, I think we had a lot of fun. We love, as all of you heard, we love geeking out on payments and what better to do it with such an awesome panel and a great moderator. So thank you. Thank you for being here.
operated it so someone else did. We use yeah. it all the time. Oh, we know nice. you want to use it. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think previous panel and it was really great. Yeah. We just weren't using it in the right way. That was the problem. We, we want to do an NDL and yeah. basically you queue all the mainstream people when to slide on, they ask questions. Yeah. Or they can ask questions during the, the um, Yeah, maybe it'll like upvote it, yeah. downvote it. Is that way that one person dominate the voting for those questions?